Welcome back. On one of our first shows here at the Listening Post back in December of 2006, we reported on the changing media scene in Uganda under President Yoweri Museveni. Way back in 1993, Uganda had just one radio station. It was state-owned. But by 2006, the country had 140 privately owned radio outlets that were broadcasting a wide spectrum of voices that state-run radio seldom heard. Fast forward now to the events of the past month. Presidential elections are coming up next year, and the incumbent is locked in a battle with the king of the country's biggest tribal region, Buganda. The conflict has spilled into the media, and President Museveni, once credited with opening up the airwaves, has now silenced four of the most popular radio stations in Uganda, and his government stands accused of torturing a well-known journalist. The Listening Post's Salah Kadar now on the changing mediascape of Uganda and the new threats to journalistic freedom in the run-up to next year's elections. The protesters fought with police from behind barricades and burning tires. Stones in one direction, tear gas in the other. Some unlucky people ran right into a group of security men who were chasing pedestrians they found on the street. When riots broke out on the streets of Kampala on the 10th of September, pictures of the clashes were beamed around the world. And whilst the Ugandan security forces cracked down hard on the demonstrators, the government cracked down just as hard on national TV stations, pressuring them not to show pictures of police brutality. I think that they are very sensitive about that because if the TV stations and journalists had not filmed, you know, policemen and the army beating up innocent civilians who were just walking on the streets, Nobody would have known what was happening in Uganda. They would have just thought, well, riots, you know, evil people. But I think that therefore the tables were turned on government because of the media. The media exposed uh, these injustices. According to the government, however, the media was adding fuel to the fire of people's unrest. The violence and lawlessness was preceded by inflammatory and sectarian broadcasts from various radio stations which systematically incited <coughs> listeners to cause chaos and destruction wherever they could. Four radio stations were ordered shut and Robert Kalundi Serumaga, a radio talk show host, was arrested and kept in detention for four days. Robert Serumaga is a highly respected and influential journalist in, in Uganda and um, it's very clear that the government did not want him um, to be um, giving his interpretation of what happened uh, over those two days. He was detained by government agents following a radio program on the 11th of September. He was um, beaten and he was um, uh, physically assaulted by these people, forced into a car, taken to an illegal center of detention in Kampala where he was held with around 20 other individuals who had been picked up uh, during a demonstration. Serumaga was charged with six counts of sedition. Fortunately for him, a previous case brought against the government by independent journalist Andrew Mwenda has put Uganda's sedition laws under constitutional review and Serumaga was released on bail. The laws which are being used are very archaic, very old-fashioned, really primitive uh, laws. Some of them come right from the colonial times. Uh, and right now, most of the journalists are being charged with sedition. Um, but they are fighting back. Serumaga and Mwenda may have escaped sentencing, but President Museveni did achieve his aim of sending a powerful message to Ugandan media. The media as a whole have been curtailed. Um, no reasonable um, discussions are happening on radio at the moment. It's got to tug a specific line. It's evident that um, Mr Museveni doesn't like uh, alternative uh, points of view or challenges to his authority and in this instance we've seen I think a, a pretty aggressive reaction by the state when in fact we need to see an investigation into the actions uh, of the state itself. I think what we're seeing right now is that Uganda is becoming uh, very fast becoming a prison for journalists. In fact I've had one of the journalists telling me that um, they think that President Museveni is competing with Robert Mugabe as to who can be more brutal and more repressive Sometimes. against the media. What's happening in Uganda right now is very symptomatic, very similar to what happens everywhere across Africa. Almost every African leader who clamps down on the media cites the chilling example of Radio Milkolin in Rwanda. 
In 1994, the radio station played a key role in inciting violence by the ethnic Hutu against the Tutsis. This was basically an extremist radio that openly called for killings. We had open calls for people out on the streets to go and, and, and kill Tutsis. Rather disturbingly, members of the Ugandan police have been telling us that their concern about potential Rwanda situation is behind some of their decisions, which we find quite concerning. But media professionals are becoming wise to this tactic. During the violence in Sierra Leone in March of this year, two radio stations were also shut down for incitement. If we look at what happened in Sierra Leone, we saw something similar, where journalists were arrested, uh, where we had um, media outlets that were threatened because they thought that they were perpetrating and inciting youths to go on the street and cause anarchy. The, the thing that has been most touted about is the, is the function or the action of the Radio Melkolin in Rwanda that mm. uh, led to the genocide. And we feel this is nothing but scaremongering that governments across the continent are, are now using as basis to shut down radio station. But given the freedoms that Ugandan media have become accustomed to, President Museveni's clampdown may not play out exactly as he hopes. The president now thinks that the best way is to clamp down further and take away licenses and stop these uh, stations from uh, performing. He is making a very big mistake. It will just backfire. If he doesn't allow the media to actually have the ability to do their job, then um, we're going to have um, outlets who are prepared to go the extra mile and do things um, clandestinely. Apart from the media becoming more solid and strong and determined to expose the bad and the injustice, we are going to see the people themselves start rebelling against the government. And they may tell uh, their views during the elections come 2011. And until those elections, just how much freedom the Ugandan media will get to report the important issues remains an open question. More Global Village Voices now on the state of media play in Uganda. I think this is not new development. Uh, previously, radio stations, newspapers have been clamped on and journalists arrested, especially radio and pre uh, mostly print. Um, so it's not really new. I believe there's free press in Uganda. Uh, compared to the all the East African countries, Uganda ranks best in free press. What we in the West often fail to grasp is that as much as we would wish, our concept of a free press does not always easily translate into Africa. While the pen may be mightier than the sword, it's an individual that always wields it. And in Africa, that individual needs to be a very brave man indeed. Finally, we usually end the show with a web video that packs a message about the media or politics, but this week, it's all about the visuals. Two graffiti artists, David Ellis and someone who goes by the name of Blue, got together recently in Italy, and they collaborated on a mind-boggling piece of work. Graffiti is an urban art form. In this case, it's been brought to life through the use of stop-motion animation and brought to the world through the user-generated wonders of YouTube. This is our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. Thank <laughs> you.